Okay, let's continue our conversation of invertebrate pests in the landscape by discussing the various control methodologies that are available to you and how and when to apply these various strategies. So here we go with our presentation of the day. And you can see in the background image, we have a ladybug, a ladybird beetle, and it will be feeding on aphids, one of the most uh, notorious and most common landscape pests. Here's a form of biological control that we appreciate and that we want to encourage in the landscape. Now, as we begin this conversation, it's important to remember the concept of action thresholds. Remember that this is the idea that you need to determine a point at which you will act. And that point is a certain number of invertebrate pests that you can recognize or a certain level of damage that you will tolerate. And depending on each plant and each horticultural circumstance, you may tolerate more or less damage. For example, in a garden setting, if you're growing annual vegetables, you may tolerate damage on parts of the plant that are not gonna be the part that you harvest for eating. Similarly, if you have annual flowers in a container or in a shrub bed, you may decide to just let whatever pests arrive, consume those plants because they are short-lived anyway. If you have perennial trees and shrubs, you may decide that some control is necessary in order to keep the plants healthy year after year. But similarly, there is some damage that you could probably tolerate and that will not hurt the plant too much to affect its growth. And so these action thresholds are different for every pest organism and for every host or every plant species you're trying to protect. But the idea is we wanna tolerate some damage and we only want to act or intervene if it's necessary. Uh, because if we let some of the pests be and continue to live in and around our plants, that is what's going to attract the natural predators and we'll have an overall more balanced and healthy landscape. So how do you know? How do you watch uh, for the insect pests? Well, there are many methods for monitoring and diagnosing uh, plant problems caused by invertebrate pests. And again, we're looking at signs and symptoms. We're watching the plant to observe the type of damage we're looking for the physical presence of the organism or signs of the organism. Some other tools we can use are traps. There are three main types of traps for invertebrates. Uh, they can be pheromone traps where they are lured with a certain chemical fragrance. And that's usually what is present in the triangular cardboard traps that you see hanging from trees. There are sticky traps, and uh, most common color is yellow. And then there are light-based traps, and these may be lit at night, or they may even have a UV sort of a bulb in them, or they may be designed in such a way that once they get in, they cannot get out because of how the sunlight is uh, creating uh, the most obvious way for them to get out, which is a trap. There's many different types and each trap is perfectly suited for one or more organisms. So you would want to look into it and do a bit of research. Additionally, we're looking for signs, the organisms themselves on the plant in question, or we are looking for the presence of organisms in other ways. For example, we can look for honeydew, which is the droppings of sucking insects that uh, are being left and deposited on the surface of our leaves. Oftentimes this will bring in a dark sooty mold fungus that is attracted to the honeydew. Or we can look for frass, and frass is the droppings from wood boring insects. Uh, frass is 
uh, like a loose powder of small round wood colored insect droppings. And so for our woody trees and shrubs, we're watching for frass on the branches, we're watching for honeydew on the leaves, and we can use traps to help determine the presence of any of these organisms. Now, a subcategory of uh, monitoring, the visual inspection, is called sampling. And the difference is that sampling is numeric, it's quantitative. And we encourage you to do sampling if you're going to manage your landscapes at a high level. And what this means is that you actually collect some kind of quantitative data, meaning you don't just see if they're there or not. Well, that would be one type of sampling, a presence absence sampling. And it may be that one is enough to do something, depending on the organism and the problem. Uh, but usually we want to help to quantify the number. And you may have no idea what that number should be in the beginning. So do your best, make up a guess. And then the idea is you can refine your sampling methods year upon year in order to get a proper action threshold for your area. The nice thing about this is you can also compare data from previous years and you can watch ongoing trends. Other methods of sampling are branch beating or shaking. This would be in a farm setting or in a market garden setting. Usually you'd walk along a row and you'd shake a branch and you may even uh, knock the branch into a basket or a net and then count the number of organisms that fall into the net of a certain species to determine if you've reached your action threshold. One of the more common methods is using the yellow sticky traps. And many of these yellow sticky traps have a grid, which makes it very convenient for getting percentages as well as for identifying the organism. Usually these are yellow in color because most insect pests are going to be attracted to the yellow color the most. However, thrips are going to be attracted to blue color. So if you can only choose one, choose yellow. But many people, many professional growers, especially in greenhouse settings, will hang up yellow and blue. And the blue is for the thrips and the yellows for almost everything else. And then there's degree day monitoring. And this is the concept of matching not just the presence or absence or abundance of an organism, but looking at the weather. So you check the weather and if the temperature is above a certain amount, then you can go and watch and see. And we're trying to think about the organism's life cycle, recognizing that they are triggered by various environmental conditions, usually temperature. So we watch out for temperature plus organisms, and you can combine that in a simple yet sophisticated way to determine whether you have enough pests to actually do something. Now let's talk about the various control methods, and I'm going to reintroduce the IPM pyramid. Remember that this is general and there's always exceptions. However, we usually want to be uh, working on the bottom of the pyramid first before we resort to the top of the pyramid. So we need to exhaust our prevention methods and then we look for cultural control methods. Then we work on physical and mechanical methods. Finally, we'll uh, consider biological control methods. And last but not least, we'll resort to chemical control only if it's absolutely necessary and all of the other methods have still not worked to an acceptable level. So let's look at cultural control. A lot of this involves with uh, the way we manage our gardens or our landscapes. First of all, we want to be picking trees and shrubs that are healthy, that are not bringing in pest organisms to the landscape, and that they're properly suited to the microclimate and the general climate of your area so that they're gonna be strong and healthy. Another thing we can do is avoid excess nitrogen or avoid putting too much fertilizer on the landscape. 
because that excess nitrogen is going to lead to sweet, tender leaf growth that uh, most of these invertebrate pests are going to be attracted to even more. And so if we don't over fertilize, we also will limit the ability of pests to attack our trees and shrubs. During a drought condition, we, wait, we want to add supplemental water. We want to irrigate. And this again is going to lead toward a healthy plant and a healthy plant can produce quite a few chemicals within their leaves that are going to resist the pest naturally. We want to avoid stockpiling old leaves and branches underneath plants that we want to protect. Mulch is good, however, too much or the wrong type or in the wrong configuration, it may just bring about a habitat for unwanted pest organisms. We wanna prevent injuring our trees needlessly. Uh, we don't want to uh, drive into them, use the string trimmer and strip the bark. We don't want to break branches unnecessarily. We want to prune in a way that's going to reduce the injury on the tree. And finally, we want to consider pest resistant varieties when we're selecting plants in the garden. Uh, in particular, things like fruit trees or roses, there has been a lot of work to develop new cultivated varieties that are resistant to some of the more pernicious pest organisms. Moving up the IPM pyramid, we can look at mechanical control. And this is where you are pruning out heavily infested branches. So you can actually remove some of the pest organisms. Now, if these are mobile pests, you, you know, they're just gonna crawl to the next place. So you're gonna want to dispose of that material carefully and prevent uh, further infection. And you wanna do your pruning in such a way that it's not going to do more harm than good, but it is a, a means at our disposal is pruning out the heavily infested branches. Now with physical control, we can wash the foliage. And oftentimes this washing is just as good as some of the other control methods that a lot of home gardeners like to do. Uh, so either a mist or a jet, usually a jet is the better uh, method. A fine spray that's going to go out in a jet stream so that it will knock off the organisms from the leaves. Aphids are a thing that come to mind. A quick stream from a hose with a jet nozzle does a great job of knocking off the organism. Now that won't be a long lasting control method, but if you go and do that once a week, that could be just enough to keep the damage down so that you don't need to do anything else. Additionally, a lot of people will resort to sprays and they'll look for maybe the organic types of sprays uh, or they'll put things in water like vinegar or soap and uh, especially like dish soap. Lots of home remedies exist in uh, organic pest control. But we find that actually it's the water, the physical water spray itself that is usually doing the majority of the work. So before you resort to some form of chemical control, even if it is organic chemical control, give a try to just a plain stream of water or even washing off the foliage more regularly so that you do not allow the buildup of these pest organisms. You can also introduce barriers, barriers such as sand, salt, copper shields. In particular, this is uh, targeted toward slugs and snails with the copper band that you can see that uh, has been placed around the vegetable garden box. The idea is these organisms don't wanna crawl over this type of material. And so you can create a little barrier that's going to prevent them from wanting to enter. Now, the only thing I recommend avoiding is salt. Maybe if you're in a high rainfall area like the Pacific Northwest or in New England, salt wouldn't be as bad of a problem. However, in Southern California, salt is very 
uh, lasting in the soil, and we don't want to have that. Uh, our dry condition causes salt to build up. And if you add more of it, you can potentially ruin the soil beyond any meaningful uh, recovery. So salt is one of the worst things to add. Don't do it. And then sticky barriers. So either um, kind of a band of Vaseline or some double-sided tape around a trunk can help to prevent ants from going up and down the tree. It can also help to uh, get other organisms stuck in a sticky barrier. And again, these are all just uh, more or less temporary solutions, especially with ants and sticky barriers. Eventually, the ants will uh, get stuck enough that they form a bridge of former ants that they use to crawl over the sticky barrier. So these are things you will have to inspect and uh, watch over time to make sure they're still functioning, but they can go a long way to preventing further problems with uh, pest infection. And then we consider biological control. There's two main types of biological control. Either you import a pest organism and you release it in your growing area, or you just try to conserve and enhance those that are already present. Usually conservation and enhancement is the better method because if you import a pest organism, first of all, there's a chance that that organism could cause its own problems. And second of all, it's very likely that without the proper habitat, your organism that you introduce is just going to fly away or run away or whatever it is, not survive in your garden. So usually you are better off trying to attract them naturally, keep what's there, and enhance the habitat. And you can do that primarily through pesticide management. Avoid using pesticides that are going to attack the beneficials as well as the harmful plant pests. Very important is to control the ant population because the ants, in particular, the Argentine ant in Southern California, does a very good job of introducing plant-eating pests. The ant will move them around, move them down into the soil, and really manage the pest population for the benefit of the ants. So you're sort of trying to outsmart the ants, and that will do a lot of effort to make other control methods for your plant pests more effective. And then finally, there's uh, habitat manipulation. You can be planting uh, beneficial plants, all sorts of different types of habitat, small bits of uh, wet, watery areas, uh, various types of nesting materials for all sorts of organisms will lead to a generally more balanced ecosystem and greater abundance of natural predators. Speaking of those natural enemies or the natural pred predators of plant pests, we generally have uh, some various categories. We are thinking about parasites. Uh, usually wasps are the primary parasite or parasitoid that is going to attack our plant-eating invertebrates. There are pathogens that exist in nature that will only go after the plant pests. There are predators, just like the praying mantis here that you can see is uh, consuming a grasshopper. Birds and lizards are all generally beneficial in the garden when it comes to interactions with our plant pests. So we want to encourage these organisms through a variety of means. Now let's talk about the last step in the pyramid the insecticides. And the image I show is of uh, obviously a startling, striking kind of uh, image, uh, not something that most of us want to be around. Uh, here we have a farmer growing rice using uh, an insecticide with uh, a fogger, meaning they're just releasing the chemical into the general atmosphere. And this person needs to protect themselves from the chemicals. And in some countries, the levels of protection are greater than in others. 
And most of us would look at this image and recognize that this individual is at extreme risk, health risk for exposure to this chemical. If this is a toxic chemical, then it's something that's going to have uh, a detrimental effect to this individual, as well as potentially to the general environment, people and otherwise. So that's why these are last resorts. We don't want to do this if we don't have to. But even if we do resort to it, let's learn a little bit more about maybe the least toxic insecticides and how to properly select and use them. First, we can consider microbial and biological insecticides. These are things like abamectin, Bt, entomopathogenic nematodes, and spinosad. Abamectin is a chemical compound that is a natural byproduct of a soil organism. This soil organism participates in decomposition and a natural fermentation byproduct is a compound called abamectin and it works as an effective insecticide. Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria, a living bacteria that will kill insect pests that are moths and butterflies. Primarily caterpillars is what we're concerned with, with Bt. And a lot of people will apply Bt to their tomatoes, for example, in order to control for the tomato hornworm. Now, with these, it's important to be just as careful as you would with ke uh, synthetic chemicals. And you want to use these as a last resort still, because you may be controlling for a certain caterpillar, and then you end up uh, really controlling for all of the moths and butterflies, including the pollinators and the endangered species as well. So I don't recommend you use BT every year, whether or not you have a problem, but it would be one thing that would help to control moths and butterflies, in particular the larval stage from consuming your plants, and it's less toxic. It's not toxic to uh, other animals or even to other insect uh, groups. Nematodes are a small microscopic worm, usually living in the soil. There are many types. Some of them are plant pests, so they will attack your plants. And we can also have the predator nematodes. So many times in nurseries, you can purchase these uh, entomopathogenic nematodes. These are nematodes that either eat other nematodes or they're nematodes that will go after insects as well. And spinosad is a material similar to abamectin. It's a product that's made by a soil organism and is similarly toxic to insect pests, a wide variety of them, but not toxic to people. So these are more biological types of insecticides that uh, won't necessarily lead to some acute or chronic health problems in humans. And if you need to use an insecticide, it's a good idea to look here first. There are botanical insecticides. These are chemicals that are derived from plants. And plants have a natural ability to fight off pests. And so people have uh, kind of harnessed those compounds and concentrated them and then turned them into uh, their own forms of insecticide. One of those is D-limonene. This is the uh, naturally occurring chemical that is uh, found in citrus. And it's used in all kinds of food products, soaps and perfumes. It's used as a pesticide for fleas and ticks, um, insecticide sprays, dog and cat repellent, fly repellent, mosquito larvicide. And it's good because it's non-toxic to birds, fish, and mammals. And just like all the others, I encourage you to exercise caution and only use these as a last resort, even if they're safe to you individually. Similarly, we have pyrethrum, 
This is a chemical that is found in chrysanthemum. Um, and note it's called pyrethrum. That's the botanical form, the organic form. It, there is a synthetic form as well called pyrethrin. So pyrethrum is the more natural form. It's been used for centuries as an insecticide and lice remedy, primarily documented in the Middle East. It's one of the most commonly used non-synthetic insecticides allowed in certified organic agriculture. It's very simple to make this. The flowers are dried, crushed, and mixed with water, and you've got yourself some pyrethrum. Uh, I have noticed that uh, many people have an allergic reaction, respiratory type reaction, when they're around a lot of chrysanthemum flowers. And so when drying, crushing, and generally uh, working with, in particular, the wild species, I still recommend you exercise caution and watch out for uh, overexposure to this chemical. And then we have neem oil. This is a very common botanical insecticide. It repels a wide variety of pests, comes from the neem tree. It's not known to be harmful to mammals, birds, or earthworms, harmless to butterflies, honeybees, and ladybugs if it's not concentrated directly into their habitat or food source. And it is a good control of um, disease organisms as well, including black spot, powdery mildew, anthracnose, and rust fungi. A lot of people will use neem as a common practice. And my recommendation is only use it if you have a good reason to. If you don't have a good reason to use it, why put it down at all? Because it is going to have some change in the environment, and you shouldn't be an automatic user of neem oil. Many times when you think you need it, there's uh, good alternatives in other forms of control. Then we have an inorganic insecticide. This is diatomaceous earth. And it used to be organic because it comes from uh, ancient marine organisms that are very small, microscopic, diatoms is what they're called. They lived and died, and there were so many of them that they formed uh, a heavy enough concentration for that mineral to be mined out of the soil. It's a calcium-based mineral, and in particular, it's in a sharp uh, microscopic form. And this sharp kind of powder uh, causes little cuts on a, a wide array of insect exoskeletons. And what it ends up doing is it absorbs lipids from the waxy outer layer of the exoskeleton. And this causes increases in evaporation of water from their bodies until they dehydrate and die. And sometimes this is mixed with uh, other things like some kind of uh, attractant something that would attract the pests to the powder, uh, encouraging them to walk through it. Uh, and uh, there you go, makes it a little more effective. This is uh, harmless to uh, people and birds and mammals if eaten, although it can be harmful to people in particular if you inhale it or breathe it. So you wanna be very careful handling this material, especially in an indoor setting or if you don't have proper protective equipment. Uh, it is used as a deworming agent in livestock and is even fed to animals in order to control internal uh, parasites as well. It's not very persistent in the landscape, so if you do use it, you may have to reapply, especially if there's wind or rain. And it's important to uh, put down a fine line that it acts as a proper barrier. But if used properly, it's very effective. And then we have insecticidal soaps. Uh, these are products you can buy. They can either be organic or inorganic, uh, usually, usually relatively safe. They're generally effective against soft-bodied insects. And they can cause damage to delicate plants. And I recommend using caution here. Remember my advice. Uh, try the water without the soap first and see if that does the same thing as the soap itself. 
It could be that just that spray of water is the thing actually doing the majority of the work. And now let's go to the very tippy top of the pyramid. And these are the things you should use as a very last resort. And here we have synthetic insecticides. And these are things like carbamates, organophosphates, and pyrethroids. Most of these are synthesized from petroleum products. Uh, oftentimes they kill when directly applied or when the pest contacts the residue. Uh, these will also usually kill the beneficials and they can be a pretty terrible form of pollution. So in a horticultural setting where you're managing a landscape, a garden, you have trees, shrubs, perennials, a very diverse system. It's kind of rare that you'll need to use anything like this. These are used primarily in uh, commercial agricultural field settings or in nursery crop production. You can see the application methodologies uh, often applied with uh, all sorts of equipment, sprayers, tractor mounted devices, and in particular, notice the personal protective equipment that the applicator is needing to wear. That's very important for these types of chemicals. Now, these chemicals at one time were considered a miracle and a great thing for nature because they generally replaced DDT. And DDT is kind of the first generation of insecticides. And that was something, again, that was considered a miracle. It could help reduce diseases and all sorts of agricultural and human uh, health issues. The problem with DDT is it's very long lived in the environment. It's very persistent and it actually works its way up the food web. And so as the organisms eat other organisms, you end up with especially predators and those who eat a lot of organisms uh, becoming very concentrated with DDT, including people. And it does lead to cancer and all sorts of other health issues, especially over the long term. It, it got so bad that uh, many of our bird species were on the brink of extinction, in particular the bald eagle and the peregrine falcon, those that are kind of the top predators especially. So the organophosphates were developed as an alternative to DDT. And the idea is that they would not persist for a long time in the environment, which sounds like a good thing. However, the problem with these is that because they don't persist, they need to be quite concentrated and they need to be quite toxic in the short term. And so in particular, these have quite a high health risk of human exposure uh, becoming sick. And this is an acute form of illness. DDT caused chronic illness. And these synthetic insecticides typically are much more dangerous for acute contact. So those individuals who are applying these insecticides need to use extreme caution, and we will potentially see health effects in people, either those who live close to these agricultural areas or those who work closely with these chemicals. And so these would be the very top of the pyramid, those to use as only a last resort, and generally we want to look for better alternatives. So one alternative, a synthetic insecticide to the organophosphates are the neonicotinoids. And you may be catching on to a trend that as these are developed, they're considered miracles or they're considered appropriate solutions to the problems of previous chemicals. And here with neonicotinoids, we have a chemical, nicotine, that's produced by plants. However, it's been synthesized in a lab and highly concentrated so that it's very effective and made into a form that can be taken up by plants and then goes inside the plant bodies. That's called systemic pesticide. The reason that is considered good by some is because 
it lasts longer. It lives inside the plant, and then you don't need to reapply these acutely toxic organophosphates more often. If you can apply a neonicotinoid once and it lives with the plant for many years or potentially for the life of the plant based on the plant and its application. So this is considered to be beneficial by many. However, remember that uh, we want to think about who we are targeting and try to be selective. The neonicotinoids are broad spectrum. They will target any organism that comes in contact and consumes in one way or another our plant that's been treated. And so here we have issues with uh, bees in particular. There's a lot of concern that pollinating honey honeybees are becoming weakened by neonicotinoid synthetic in insecticides. Additionally, the birds and other organisms that will eat the invertebrates can also become uh, infected with these uh, toxic chemicals. So ecologically thinking, we don't want to use these if we can avoid it. Many nurseries still will use neonicotinoid in their plants, and it's to their economic advantage because consumers don't want to purchase a plant that is full of bug-eaten holes on the leaves. They want to purchase a plant that looks picture perfect. And if applying the neonicotinoid causes an increase in plant sales, then uh, there's an incentive to do so. So it's up to consumers to demand that uh, these neonicotinoids not be used in the retail nurseries, and that will change the incentive and uh, change the, the overall uh, practice in the industry. But this is a thing that certain countries are looking to ban using in their country altogether. And one of the things currently that is kind of the cutting edge of our research, we're trying to get to the bottom of what actually are the neonicotinoids doing, and we're wanting to uh, act responsibly. So there's not enough evidence to say anything for certain yet, but uh, we can recognize that these are at the top of the IPM pyramid. And if and when these are used, they should be used only after really all the other methods were used in combination. And then only after necessary to get the pest organism down below the action threshold. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this overview of invertebrate pest control methods and a tour along the IPM pyramid as we look at the various control methodologies. Remember, I, I introduced them as kind of a hierarchy that you should do one before the other, but any given circumstance may provide different context. And you may find that skipping a step on that pyramid turns out to be the least harm, the least intensive of an intervention. And usually that's what we're trying to go for. I'll let nature do most of the work, and then you do as little as possible to keep the landscape healthy enough to be acceptable. And all those things have, uh, you know, not necessarily a clear definition. So I give you a broad overview. It's up to you to be responsible and think critically and solve every problem in its own context.